In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. Ah, oh, hallelujah. Good morning, Word of God. Can we stand together as we reverence the reading of His Word? Are you blessed to be in the assembly today? Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, that's in the New Testament right behind 1 Peter. If you're struggling, you can find Hebrews, you're close. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. 2 Peter, if you got a brand new Bible, the pages are stuck together. Sometimes it can be a little challenging finding these scriptures. 2 Peter chapter 3. So today we pick up with part 13, part 13 of the Genesis prophecies. If you're taking notes, that's how long we've been in this, in this study. And I'm so excited about what we're going to be getting into today because I've had a chance to minister twice already, 8 and 945. You came to the 1130 service. Why? Because you wanted to go to Cracker Barrel this morning. For whatever your reason, welcome to the third service where we try to ignore the clock. But sometimes it's hard for me to ignore the hunger, so we shall see what happens, all right? Second Peter chapter 3, giving you time to get there. I don't know whether you noticed it in the offering video, but that was filmed from our Bossier campus. We got, yes, we got our certificate of occupancy this week. Fire marshal did the inspection, all clear. Right now, we're looking at opening up on Labor Day weekend. That's the first Sunday of September. <laughs> Glory to God. And it's going to be shocking off for those of you that live in the uh, Bossier area, those east of Red River. Uh, you're going to be, it's just, it's, it's beautiful what, what, what uh, has been built over there. So real soon, all right, 2 Peter chapter number 3, if you're there, just say Amen. And we'll look at it in verse number three. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Is Jesus really coming? It seems like it's been so long. Preachers have been talking about it for hundreds of years. Where is the promise of his coming? You may not remember this, but years and years ago, Time Magazine did an article basically asking what would God do next? And it was based on the cross and all these other things as if, man, God's tried everything. What will he do next? He is in complete control. Amen. And he will fulfill everything that he has spoken. So verse 4 says, in saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And I think, you know, some of us might have that mindset that everything, you know, had a beginning and it's just continued uninterrupted since the start. But verse 5 says, but for this they willingly are ignorant of. Willingly ignorant means you don't want to know. You, you can't nobody tell you nothing. It's like my mama used to say. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. The earth standing out of the water and in the water. And whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. That's the flood recorded in Genesis 11, Genesis 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now. Read that part out loud. But the heavens and the earth which are now. So he's talked about the life since creation, how there was a flood, and then now where we are today, verse 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men, which means God has made a reservation. There's a reservation of judgment. 
A reservation means something's coming. You call that hotel because you know you're going to be in Orlando on such and such date, and you make a reservation. The reservation's about the future. And the Bible says God has made a reservation of a day of judgment. Now, some we want to hear about, but it's true. And then all of a sudden, in talking about all this, he injects this statement in verse 8 that becomes a key to understanding what we're going to be dealing with today. He says, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as what? As one day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. And I pray right now for all who would be under the sound of my voice at this very moment, those here in this assembly, those that are watching this live feed, our television broadcast, I ask, Father, that you would bless our hearing and that by your Holy Spirit we would receive revelation knowledge. We ask you for wisdom. We ask you for spiritual understanding, that you would give us revelation knowledge, spiritual conviction of truth, words of hope, faith, and salvation. I ask now, Father, that you would speak through me what you would have spoken, that your Holy Spirit would speak by me, that your word would be on my tongue. Father, that you would make my tongue the pen of a ready writer, that I could write on the hearts and minds of these, your people, your anointed word, removing their burdens and destroying their yokes forever. As we boldly declare that, Satan is defeated. We are redeemed, and Jesus is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Greet two or three people and then take your seats this morning. Hallelujah. We read before the prayer as we pick up this morning part 13 of the Genesis prophecies. If you want a subtitle for today, I would call it the days of creation part two. The days of creation part two. Now, I tried to do a review at the eight o'clock service. It took too long. So I told our 945 service, if you wanted a review from last week, sign on to YouTube and go back and watch that message, all right? Because I got too much to unpack today to really go back and review what we've talked about over these last couple of weeks as we, as we have dealt with the days of creation, specifically dealing with that seventh day that God had ended all his labors and rested and was glorified in his creation, how that he made man on the sixth day and that man was commanded by God to always remember that seventh day, keep it holy, and the reasons why. Number one, to remember that God had created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. And then secondly, to remember that, they were, that we were no longer in bondage and to ignore the voice of the taskmaster that a man was to labor six days but then rest on the seventh. And we've looked at Jesus being that picture of that seventh day a rest, from our sal a rest as it relates to our salvation that's both natural and spiritual. When we look at what Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29, come unto me all ye that labor and I will give you what? Rest. And so we've been looking at that seventh day. Now today I want to turn our attention to that seventh day and see it a little bit differently. Because what we read before the prayer here in 2 Peter 3 is a message in God's word, that everything has not just continued the same since creation. That since creation, there's actually been a judgment upon this earth that we know called the flood. Now, later in this series, we're going to study the flood and, and look at it, Lord willing, and what went on in the days of Noah. But Verse, verses 5 and verses 6 are saying, hey, everything's not been just the way it was since creation. There was a global flood, and just like God res uh, uh, judged the earth then, he's made reservations to judge this earth again. And that's what verse 7 is speaking of, this judgment that's coming upon the earth. And then right in the heart of that, he says in verse 8, not to be ignorant of this one thing, that one day... 
is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as what, church? As one day. Now, you may have heard that principle spoken. I have. I had a pastor years and years ago when I had just got saved, when I was talking to him about prayer, told me, Brother James, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, and you don't know when the Lord's going to answer that prayer. My mind was, never heard nobody live in no thousand years, so I guess I need to give up on that prayer. But that is not the context that we see this statement. This statement shows up where God is speaking of life since creation and a reservation that he's made to judge this earth the second time. He's judged it once by water. He'll judge it again by fire. Now notice in verse number nine, verse nine. He says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. That just means God's not forgotten what he said. He's gonna keep his word. He's gonna honor his word. So he hasn't, you know, become slack when it comes to the return of the Lord. Is Jesus really coming again? Will God judge this earth? Is there even a day of judgment coming? And so he's saying, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. Look at that in verse number nine. But is long-suffering to usward. And aren't you grateful that God is long-suffering? Aren't you grateful that God, because see, we're bad about giving up on people. You know, we, 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 you know I've, I've talked to parents that, you know, their children are a little wayward around 18, 19 years old, and they think, oh, it's over, it's over. They, they, they know the Lord. They know better. They've turned to the streets. Wait a minute. You were in the streets. You didn't get saved until you turned 42. So why is your child going to bust Hades wide open at 18 when you didn't give your life to Jesus till you turned 42? So why, why, why can't, why, do you not think God is gracious and long-suffering so we got to stop giving up on people so quick? God is long-suffering, amen? And we're going to talk more about that, Lord willing, a little bit later in this series because it's going to come up. It, uh, uh, in regards to the days of Noah, because God demonstrated his long suffering. So we'll talk about this more later. But he says he's long suffering to usward. Notice this last statement in verse 9 Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let's read that part out loud together. Ready? Read. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Do you know that person that went to bed last night, if they went to bed with no good on their mind, God is long-suffering even toward that person? That person that had violence and destruction on their mind last night, God says, I want you saved. You've never met a man or woman that God couldn't save because you've never met a man or woman that God did not love. He's long-suffering. Why, why is he telling us this right here? I'm, I'm going to tell you why, ba based on Scripture. Is that biblically, the allotted time that God has given man on this earth has expired. The amount of time that God has given man on this earth, that clock has been expired, but God has not ended it all. He's not brought forth that final judgment. And you might ask why. Because there are a lot of people throughout the years, and you know this to be true, that have predicted when Jesus was coming, that have predicted the end of the world. It was going to happen back in the 80s. It was going to happen at Y2K. Does anybody remember Y2K? I mean, we, even Prince said, we got a party like it's 1999. Because at the end of 1999, it's over Y2K. Computers are going to all shut down. Lights are going to go out. And God's going to have no other choice but send his son and end the whole thing. And there's been red moons and big moons and blue moons and a lining of moons. You had all these folk write books and tell us, this is it. This is the end. And guess what? We are still here. I had somebody years ago over some red moon. They got so mad at me. They left the church. They left this church. You know why? Because they said I was being uh, uh, irresponsible by not warning the people that this red moon was coming and it was going to be the end of the world. Now, I promise you, if you wrote a book 15 years ago about a red moon was going to end the world, ain't nobody going to buy that book today. 
Now, I don't mean to offend anybody that buys into all that. I'm just saying, I'm not going to let nobody tell me that they know the day and they know the hour that Jesus is coming when Jesus has already told me in his word, no man knows the day and no man knows the hour. And this series, even though it has the word prophecy in it, is not about a prediction of when Jesus is coming or the end of the world. That's not what this is about because Jesus himself already told me nobody knows it. So if Jesus told me nobody's going to know, even if I did come up with a date, he going to change it because don't nobody know. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying, do you? Now, he has given us signs in his word, signs to make us aware of the timing and the season. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 26 verses, Matthew 24 verses 1 through 8, he literally gives us a time that lays out descriptions of what it's going to look like as we lead into the end. And there's no doubt all those things have come to pass. So he gives us a, a, a reference, but, but not a date. And, and, and here's what I want you to see, is that right here in the heart of this, uh, this text, talking about the coming judgment, the end of the world as we know it, he says, hey, God's not forgotten his promise. God's not slacking. He's just not willing that any perish, which means if we get one more day than what was promised us, it's because God is long-suffering. And I don't know about you, but his goodness has been in my life on days I didn't think I deserved it because he's long-suffering. Hey, does anybody know what I'm talking about? I have seen God's goodness in my life on a Tuesday when I thought what I had done on that Monday was enough for him to sign me off. But yet I woke up the next morning and there it was. Weeping may have endured for a night, but joy came in the morning. Why? Because his mercies are brand new every morning and great is his his faithfulness. None of us can really comprehend and, and, and grasp the long suffering and goodness of God that He is truly not willing that any should perish. Now, it doesn't mean that the end isn't coming because it is. It doesn't mean that there won't be a final judgment on this earth because there will be. It just means that if it looks like God has given us more time than what He said, it is because He is long suffering. Have you ever had somebody, maybe a parent, give a warning, and they say, you do this one more time, and this is what I'm going to do, and then the, the child messed around and did it one more time, and you done told everybody, if they do it one more time, out of my house, and then lo and behold, one more time happened. And then them friends came around and said, what'd you do? What'd you do? Put, did you, did you, did you put the child out? No. I didn't put him out. See there, see there, see there, all that talk. You're going to put them out. You ain't going to put nobody out. Well, I know. We had a long talk. No, oh, no, no, no. Long talk, long talk. See, you don't understand the long suffering of God. God always reserves the right to show mercy when he wants to. I know we get sometimes this position where we're ready for God to do it and do it now. But God is long-suffering. That's why I could not be God, because I wouldn't be long-suffering. There are some cities that would no longer exist right now, because I would have already judged them. Google Maps would not be able to find them. Waze would not be able to find them. You couldn't even ask Siri. Siri wouldn't find it. You would be rerouting and recalculating into infinity when I got through with that city if I were God. I'd be like, no, we ain't having this. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't be God. Nobody would not believe in me because I would convince them immediately that I exist. <laughs> All it would take was one person. I don't believe in God. I'd say, oh, you don't. <laughs> Let me show you I'm God. <laughs> oh, I need a sign. Oh, you get a sign. All right. I'd be elevating your car. I'd be doing some stuff make you believe. <laughs> but that, but that, that's not God, right? I couldn't be God. And I'm not the only one that had this problem because when they tried to stone Jesus and wouldn't let him in Samaria, the disciples said, Jesus, come on right now. Call the fire down. Call it down right now. And Jesus said, no, no, we're not going to call fire down. That's the wrong spirit. You don't know what spirit you're operating by. I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save it. So God is long-suffering, and he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Hallelujah. But verse 10 says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. My mama used to tell me that all the time. Keep me up all in the night as a little boy scared. 
between my brother reading Revelation to me and my mama telling me Jesus was coming like a thief, no wonder I couldn't sleep at night. And when I did sleep, I had nightmares. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. You talk about global warming, they could pass as much money as they want to spend on a quote new green deal and it won't stop the climate change that's coming when God chooses to, to judge this earth. I know it sounds like I'm making a joke, I'm being real. God's going to do with this earth what he wants to do with it because it's his. And when he flooded the earth to judge it in Noah's day, he didn't ask one person to turn on a water hose. He already had it reserved in the earth. Water came from beneath. Water came from above. And when he judges this earth by fire, he will not need World War III. He will not need nuclear warfare. He won't need America. He won't need Russia. He won't need China. He won't need nobody. He's God. He's already got the mechanism to judge this earth within itself. He's got earthquakes. He's got volcanoes. He's got everything he needs to judge this earth without any aid of man. Are y'all seeing what I'm saying to you? Some of y'all are like, now, why did I go to church today? <laughs> Stay with me. It's going, the light is coming, all right? Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? If there is a God and he's going to judge us one day and judge this earth, how should I be living? Verse 12, looking forward and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's recorded in Revelation chapter 21, prophesied in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Read that part with me. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. If you would, turn back with me to the Gospel of Matthew. I want to look at something that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter number 16. So, we just read in 2 Peter about God having made a reservation since creation, man may think, well, everything's continued like it was since the start. Overlooking that there's been a flood, God's judged this earth once already. He promised he would never judge the earth with water again. And so he made a rain promise. A rain promise. The word bow, B-O-W, in Hebrew means covenant. So God made a rainbow. And rainbow means rain covenant, a rain promise. And so God put a rainbow in the earth that every time you see it, it would serve as a reminder. Even though it's been a rain, there won't be a flood to a global scale. That's the real reason for the rainbow. Amen. All right? It's a reminder to us that God keeps his promise. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that the throne of God has a canopy over it, and, and I think Isaiah 6, of a rainbow. So God is seated under a rainbow, and that rain covenant is his eternal reminder that he keeps his promise, and he gave it to us in the earth to see it and say, oh, wow, that's God's promise. He will never flood the earth again with water. But then after 2 Peter 3 says that there's already been one judgment and there's coming another one, the next judgment is by fire, right in the heart of that in verse 8, he says, hey, don't be ignorant of this one thing, that a day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. And put this in your notes. Because Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6 tell us that before God creates this new heaven and this new earth, which, by the way, could be the existing earth renovated, new, 
not necessarily the creation of another planet, but this one made new, which is my belief. Don't write me no ugly letter. I, 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 I can believe what I want to believe. I don't believe some of this mail I get. All right, so uh, right before we read of this new heaven and this new earth in Revelation 21, we get in Revelation 20 a grand finale on planet earth as we know it. And it's called the millennium. It's the 1,000 year reign of Christ. It tells us in Revelation 20 verses four through six that for 1,000 years on this planet, Jesus will sit on the throne and rule and reign. Oh, come on, somebody. And the Bible even tells us that they which believe will live with him, will rule and reign with him on this earth for 1,000 years. That's what Revelation chapter 20 teaches. And I know for some, they're like, oh, that's craziness. You know, man wrote the Bible. Well, you know, everything you probably believe was written by man. But I do believe the Bible is written by God. But think of it for a minute. A thousand years? Well, how long has it been, according to the Word of God, since creation? 6,000 years. So, biblically, if I believe the Bible, from, 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 from Adam's first breath on the sixth day of creation, all the way to where we are today, a little over 6,000 years have passed, and I know that when it comes to this planet, that last 1,000 years is for Jesus to reign. Revelation 20 tells us this. So let me try to make this simple for anybody that might be confused at this point. Look at the seven days of creation that we've studied over the last two weeks. Six days belong to man. Six days man gets to work. Six days man was to labor. But that seventh day belonged to who? It belonged to God. It was his day of rest. It was the day that he was glorified. It was the first day that Adam experienced. It was a day of God's glory. So if you take a one week, one work week, and you say six days belong to man, the seventh is God's. A day is with the Lord as a thousand years. Man given 6,000 years on this earth, and that last 1,000 years belongs to Jesus. Can everybody see that? Isn't that beautiful? Now, if you can see that, you might ask yourself the question, well, wait a minute, it's 2022, it's been, you know, as I preach this, so, we, you know, we're well over 2,000 years since Jesus walked this earth, so why are we still here if that's true? That's why God injected in his word that he's not forgotten what he said, he's not forgotten his promise, he's not slacking, he's not, not ignoring the calendar, but he's what? Long-suffering, which means he is intentionally waiting, prolonging, because he's not willing that anybody perish, but that all come to repentance, which means God can wait as long as he wants to wait, but the only reason that he's waiting is he wants more people saved. That's good. That's a good God, hallelujah. And I can't wait till we study the flood because he did the same thing in the days of the flood. He did the exact same thing in the days of the flood. I'll give you a little preview. Y'all are 1130 service, that's why you got here. You came 1130 because you want a little more than what the other two got. Enoch in Genesis 5 was the first person to ever preach a judgment was coming, an end was coming. Enoch's preaching began with a man by the name of Methuselah's birth. Methuselah was born, Enoch started preaching. Methuselah lived 969 years. And when he died, God sent the flood which meant Methuselah, the oldest man in the Bible, lived 969 years. His lifespan, at the start of his lifespan, God started warning of a judgment. On the death of his life, the flood came, which means his lifespan separated God warning it and God actually doing it. He's the oldest man in the Bible, and his name literally means long-suffering. And I believe he's a picture of the church. 
Because the church, born on the day of Pentecost, after seeing Jesus ascend back to the Father, and two angels telling the disciples, this same Jesus that you've seen him ascend will descend in the same manner he ascended. So get busy. And with the, and with the birth of the church became the, came the message, he's coming again, he's coming again. But there's also coming a day, according to Revelation chapter 4, that the church is not going to be here because God's going to take it out. And when he takes the church out, what's going to start? The judgment, which means the life of the church is just like the life of Methuselah before the flood, that it, 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 the, the warning comes, and at the end, the judgment comes. We are here right now for a reason. The church is not the, the, to, to be the, 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 the place on planet Earth where you enjoy your potluck on every first Sunday. The, the church is not meant to be a building that we pass by and say, oh, what beautiful stained glass. No, the church is to be a people group in the earth that is preaching Jesus and demonstrating the love and truth of God to a population of people that need to know there is a God in heaven that sent his son to die for you and eternal life is real and you're going to come to know eternal life either by death or by his return. But either way, you need Jesus and it is the purpose of the church to preach Jesus to a world that needs him. That's our purpose. If you can enjoy a potluck along the way, then glory to God. Just don't be the one and make sure everybody ate what you brought. Did you try my gumbo? 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 Everybody know if one in every pot love. I guess there's that, not that many Baptists here after all. <clears throat> Back to the word. Has anybody ever been to a pot love? Okay, all right. Now you know what I'm talking about. Did anybody ever have somebody at the potluck insist that you try what they brought? And it's real bad when, when two people brought the same thing. <laughs> Baby, that ain't my broccoli and rice casserole. Where'd you get that? <laughs> oh, you got to try mine. <laughs> oh, man. My church spoke so big, man, all them potlucks. Eating everybody's version of broccoli and rice and cheese. I did not mean to offend you. Back to the word. Matthew 16. Watch this in verse number 24. If you're there, say amen. Matthew 16, verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So Jesus is talking about profit and all that we do in the world to gain, to gain, to make more money, to do more, to have more experiences. We're always going after more, 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 more. Jesus said, what are you losing in your pursuit of more? What's happened to your soul? Are you saved? Is your soul been saved? If you are saved, is your soul healthy? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death. What you say? I like that. Let me read that part again. There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So Jesus just said not everybody's going to die. Now that's a heavy statement, enough to make somebody change the channel and get up and leave the church. Jesus just said there'll be some standing here that won't die. Now put your bookmark, if you would, Right here in Matthew 16. Now, you got to do this. Put that bookmark right there in Matthew 16 because we're going to come back to it. And turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. So Jesus just made a heavy statement, and we got to finish reading what he said 
But to really understand that statement, I want to show you something in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So Jesus just said, you've been working, you've been working, you've been working, more, more, more. What, what, what have you really gained if you lost your soul? Now watch this in 1 Thessalonians 4. Because Jesus just made a heavy statement. He just said, not everybody is going to die. Some of you will be alive when I return. That's a heavy statement. Now, I don't know about you, but let it be, Lord, that you come while I'm alive. Is there anybody that would rather go through the cloud than the clod? Man, I am ready. Have you ever had a day when you were like, Jesus, could you just go ahead and come right now? Have you ever been in a situation that you said, you know, if the rapture could just happen right now, this would all be resolved? Thank God for that hope. Now, it's a reality, and I don't want to make light of that. And I want to show you something in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that sadly preachers, and I'm a preacher, don't preach enough except at funerals. So I'm going to show you something that shows up quite often at a funeral. But we need it right now. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, if you're there, say amen. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. That means not knowing, not knowing. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, that's not referring to taking a nap or being at bed at night. This is talking about they've died, they've passed away, they're asleep in the grave, all right? That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So I think about my mom and dad. Both have gone on to be with the Lord. I, I, was I sorrowful when they died? Yes. What did I cry and weep? Yes. Did, did, is there a day that goes by that I don't think about them? No. Every day. But I have the hope based on the word of God, that because my mother and my father knew Jesus, that they are with Jesus and I will see them again. And that's not a fairy tale. That's me putting faith in the written word of God. Come on, somebody. And I know all y'all relate to that. And I want you to know that heaven and eternal life is not some fairy tale that desperate people cling to so that they can find some kind of peace in the midst of sorrow. But that eternal life is a reality that God has promised in his word that all of us are going to step into, and, 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 but only those that have been born again and reconciled to God step into eternal life with Jesus. But he's saying here that if you have hope, then you can have comfort even if that person has passed away. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, read the rest with me, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So when the Lord returns, he returns with those that have already passed on. As a matter of fact, when Revelation 19 speaks of Jesus returning, it says that he gathers all his from one end of heaven to the other, which means heaven would have already been populated with those that have already passed on and that they return with him. But we just read Jesus say in Matthew 16 that some of you won't see death. Verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. That we which are alive and remain, read that part out loud. That we which are alive and remain, keep reading, unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So here now the word of God is saying again, not everybody's going to die. Some will be alive when he returns. That's what Jesus was talking about when he said two will be in the field, the one will be taken, the other left. Two will be grinding at the mill, the one is taken and the other left. So be watchful, for you know not when your Lord comes. Ten prepared for a wedding, but five, uh, ten expecting a wedding, but five, only five had oil in their lamps. And so when the bridegroom came and said, okay, it's time, five went, five were left behind saying, oh, wait, we don't have no oil. Too late. So verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, 
And with the trump of God, or the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, read verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What words? The words that when Jesus returns, there'll be some that are alive and remain, that believe in Jesus, that will go with him. Too few talking too little about the coming of Jesus. Now, what would make us not talk about the coming of Jesus? We're so caught up in what we can gain. What would make a preacher not tell people this? Because we, 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 we as preachers, and, and I'm going to put myself in there. So nobody says, oh, he thinks he's something. No, I don't think I'm done. I am who I am by the grace of God. But when we, when we get so focused on this earth and we forget heaven, we're not benefiting the flock. Because we can be so earthly minded, we're of no heavenly good. But we can't have a head in there. We can't be so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good. We can't just go hide out in our house or eat in our Bibles and don't go nowhere. What are you doing? Oh, I'm waiting in my chair. What are you waiting on, Jesus? <laughs> well, you don't ever get out. No, this world's dark, dark. Jesus warned me about this dark world. I'm staying in my rocking chair right here till he comes. Yep, I'm going to be right here. We ever thought about preaching somebody? Ah, oh, somebody else will preach. You ever thought about teaching Sunday school? Awesome, oh, else do that. See, you're so heavenly minded, you know, the earthly good. We're in the earth right now for a reason to be light in the earth, to be salt in the earth, to be ministers and preachers in the earth. There are things God's equipped you to do nobody else can do. So we got to recognize the eternal hope while we do life from day to day. Because he says, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with the, them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So just, I don't have to go through the means of death to see the Lord, not if he returns before I die. Now, when is that going to happen? That's the ultimate question. So chapter 5, verse 1 says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a what? Thief in the night. Now, with all this in mind, go back with me to that bookmark in Matthew 16. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says, Yes, Jesus is coming again. No, we don't know the day or the hour. And yes, we which are alive and remain shall go with him. I read what I'm getting, to what I'm getting ready to share with you. I read this at the 945 service. I'm not going to read it now, but I'm going to give it to you for your notes. In Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches. The only thing that was common to all seven churches is that he ended the letter the same way. And this is what he said. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Then in chapter 4 of Revelation, the Bible says after this, John by the Spirit of God says after this, a door was opened in heaven. And he heard a trumpet that said, come up hither. And he says, immediately, I was in the spirit and he's before the throne. Revelation chapter 4 verses 1 forward is a picture of the rapture and the closing of the church age. The end of what we know as, as the church age. And from that moment forward, the church is in heaven. As a matter of fact, you get a picture in chapter 5 where the church is around the throne singing praise unto the lamb that had been slain. Singing the song of the redeemed. And the Bible says every nation was represented. Every tongue was represented. All people were represented. Why? Because the blood of Jesus would have saved Men from different ages and different locations, all people, all places, all nations, all tongues gathered together around the throne for the marriage supper of the Lamb that would last seven years, a celebration in heaven where we're going to all be together as one no matter what we look like. Therefore, I say unto you, if you can't worship with somebody right now that doesn't look like you, your system is going to be shocked when you get to heaven because there won't be a white church in heaven or a black church in heaven or a this church in heaven or our denominational church in heaven, that there will be one church, one, one people that have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And you might be shocked to find out who's there and who's not. (laughs) 
So I love days of heaven on earth. I, I, I want to worship with folk that don't look like me, that don't have the same necessarily walk of life as me or the same tradition, you know, and, and upbringing as I do, where, 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 we, where the common denominator is Jesus. Hallelujah. And that's the song that is sung in Revelation chapter 5 as the scene shifts to heaven because that's where the church has been raptured by the voice of the trumpet in Revelation chapter 4. And then the scene is going to shift back to the earth in chapter 6 as God begins to release his judgment. Seven years of judging this earth before Jesus returns, busting open the eastern sky, winning the battle of Armageddon that is against the biggest army that's ever been populated. And where is this army coming from? It's coming from the east. So look for the empowerment of China because the Bible already tells us that it will be empowered. And not just the east, but the north, Russia, Turkey, all those nations will become stronger. So look for that to happen. No wonder we got people in office that care more about China and all these other places than they do our place. Why? Because you got one or two type of leader. You got one that's thinking about the health of the nation and you got the other one thinking about a global agenda. I've read the end of the book. It goes global and that's the problem we're facing right now. But God already told us that day was coming and it will not be resolved until Jesus returns in Revelation 19 when he establishes his kingdom, defeats those armies at the battle of Armageddon and establishes a 1,000 year reign. You just heard the whole Bible in 20 seconds. Glory to God. Hey. Everything is coming together just like he said it would. So Jesus here in Matthew chapter 16 says this. He says, there's some of you that won't even experience death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now forget that big old chapter 17 is there because the Holy Ghost didn't write that. Man put that there to aid our study and reading. So notice if you read chapter 16, verse 28, and kept reading, I want you to notice how it's going to read. Are, are you there? I need you to see this. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And after six days, wait a minute. Six days after what? Why is that even in the Bible? What do you mean after six days? So let's just pretend that we read the Bible or we read the Bible like so many of us do. We read it by verse and chapter and then we stop. So let's say you're doing your annual Bible reading and you decided to stop at chapter 16, verse 28. So it's not there. You don't see it, all right? Then the next day you pick it up and you don't read what came before and you just start at chapter 17. And after six days, Jesus takes Peter. See, when, until you read it together, it doesn't have the same meaning. Am I making sense? No, we're let's study. Let, let, let's get in the Word and study it. Why is that there? What does he mean after six days? And what would happen if I applied the key I read in 2 Peter 3, 8? A day, help me if you know it. A day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So Jesus said, not everyone will see death. Some will be alive and see the Son of Man come in his kingdom. And after 6,000 years, that man changed the Bible. I'm not changing the Bible. Teaching the Bible. Stay with me. Jesus if, if what I just said don't make sense in the next five minutes, then you can say I changed the Bible. But give me this, all right? After six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up. He took them up. Somebody say he took them up. He took them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. Transfigured. What does that mean? That means what was on the inside came on the outside. And what was inside of Jesus, when it came on the outside of Jesus, Jesus now doesn't look like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John Jesus. He looks more like Revelation chapter 1 Jesus. He's transfigured, verse 2. 
His face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. He is glowing. He's in his glorified body, and that is how he is described in Revelation. So Jesus has just taken on his heavenly form. He's just taken on the form that we read about in Revelation. He doesn't look like the son of Mary right now. And Peter, James, and John got to see it. When did they get to see it? They got to see it when they went up. When did they go up? Well, it was six days. Six days after something. Six days after what? Six days after Jesus said, not everybody's going to die. Some of you are going to see me come. See, I believe this is a picture of creation to the return of Jesus. From creation to the return of Jesus, that there'll be some that, that will be alive at the end of that sixth day or at the end of that expiration, that time that God has given man. Even Satan knows he has a lease that will expire. In Luke chapter 4, when he tempted Jesus, he acknowledged that power on the earth had been given to him. In Revelation, 9, uh, Revelation 12, when he comes to make war, when Satan is making war against the saints, the Bible says he knew he had but a short time. That means even the enemy knows he don't have it forever, that he's got a clock that is ticking and his lease on earth is going to expire. And God knows his lease on earth is getting ready to expire. God knows he gave man this allotted amount of time, allotted amount of time before he would come and seal the deal on what is the seventh day or the 7,000th year. And the only reason that day has not come yet is there are some still some folk right now here that are not saved yet that he's hoping and, and, and long suffering toward their salvation you might be that person now you you ain't seen nothing yet watch what's getting ready to happen verse 3 and behold there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah I know in the New Testament it says Elias but that's the same word in Hebrew the Old Testament Elijah and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Moses and Elijah, what are y'all doing here? This is significant. This is significant. This is significant. I'm going to tell you why. Moses died. As a matter of fact, he died before he ever saw the promised land. What a shame. I've met people that read that story and they ache for Moses. Like, Moses, man, how did you not get to go there? And there's all these theories. Well, he struck the rock. He did. I, I understand all that. There's a bigger reason. Moses was the lawgiver. Moses was the lawgiver. The way into heaven and the way into God's promise would not be by law. That's why God sent Jesus after 4,000 years of a law. Moses couldn't get him into the promise. It took Yahshua. You say, no, it didn't. It took Joshua. I know, but in Hebrew, that's Yahshua. And Yahshua is the same name as the transliterated name, Jesus. All Jesus is is an English transliteration of Yahshua. Joshua and Jesus, same name. Who got the children of Israel into the promised land? Yahshua, not Moses. Who's going to get me into heaven? Yahshua, not Moses. I'm not going to get there because I did everything just right, crossed all my T's and dotted all my I's. No, I am going to get there because Jesus is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by him. So Moses, Moses died. He died. He died even before he got across Jordan. But this other guy that's there, Elijah, guess what? Never died. Never died. Never saw death. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches me and you in, in the book of 2 Kings chapter 2 that God sent a heavenly chariot and picked that boy up and took him on home. 
What's really amazing is that when you study it out and you in include the book of Jude, you find that it is easy to see that when God sent that chariot after Elijah, he also picked up the body of Moses. Jude tells me that Satan made a dispute with Michael over the body of Moses, not wanting that body to be retrieved from the earth. And Michael was like, boy, I done put you out of heaven. Don't make me do something else. And said, the Lord rebuked thee. And Satan had to give up the body of Moses. And not only was was Elijah taken to heaven, but Moses was taken with him. What's significant about that? You had the dead go before him, and you had the alive go before him. There is coming a day when those that have died and those that are alive will become as one in the presence of Jesus. This is not a fairy tale. This is the word of the living God. You're going to see that person again, that loved one that's gone on before you. There's coming a day of a family reunion when the dead in Christ and those which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in in the presence of Jesus, glory to God, is happening. Isn't that good? But there's something else. There's something else because Jesus said something about these two cats. I don't mean to disrespect them. I'll get a letter for that one too. Moses represents law. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. Elijah represents prophecy. He was the poster boy of all prophets. You might say, why? Why wasn't Jeremiah the one? Why wasn't Isaiah the one? Why wasn't Daniel the one? Why is Elijah the one that the Bible speaks so much of? Why is he the one that believers look to? Why was he the one that was going to be whose spirit would baptize John the Baptist to prepare the way of the Lord? Why would it be the spirit of Elijah on John the Baptist? Why not the spirit of Jeremiah on John the Baptist? Why not the spirit of Hosea on John the Baptist? Why was it the spirit of Elijah on John the Baptist? Because Elijah, unlike all them other prophets, never died. That might make you popular. So guess who's in front of Jesus? Moses represents all law. Elijah representing all prophecy. And what did Jesus say about law and prophecy? He said, I came not. I came not. To destroy law, I came not to destroy prophecy. I came to fulfill law and prophecy. So you got the lawgiver and you got the prophet both in front of Jesus. Why? Everything in the word of God points to Jesus. Everything in the word of God is about Jesus. Every law, every commandment, every prophecy points to him. And now you got God, Jesus, the Holy Ghost, Peter, James, and John, and Moses and Elijah all gathered high up in this supernatural mountain. Jesus said, heaven and earth would pass away. A little sweat got my mic, man. I'll tell you what. <laughs> Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away before my word pass away. What did he say? He said, all law would fail. All prophecy would fail before I will fail. So it only makes sense that there's... It only may... It only makes sense that there would become... This, there, would, there, would, there would be a day of a grand finale. A 6,000 year finale in the making. Well, the one that gave the law gets to see Jesus the way nobody's seen him yet. And the one that represents all prophecy sees Jesus in a way ain't nobody seen him yet. And Peter, James, and John are there so somebody can bear record that this thing went down. You say, why didn't just Peter go? He's the one who knew Jesus was. Why didn't just John go? He's the beloved disciple. Why didn't James go? He, 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 you know, he, he's the one that, 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 that was so engulfed in the love of God. Why, 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 why didn't you want to? Because in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. He got him three witnesses. And they see Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And if you ever wondered, 
If you ever wondered who all these two witnesses are that keep showing up, they showed up outside the tomb and they said, he ain't here, he's risen. Who do you think that was? That was Moses and Elijah, fulfillment of all law and prophecy. What you say? Who is that in the Old Testament that comes down in the earth after the church has been raptured and they're preaching? Who is that? None other than, than, than God's poster boy for law and prophecy. It's Moses and Elijah. They are a dynamic duo. Powerful, man. They got to ride in something I ain't never rolled in, a heavenly chariot together. One alive and one was dead. I can just see Elijah now looking at Moses. Man, what was it like to be dead? And Moses looked back at Elijah and said, what was it like to go alive? The living and the dead. Because he's the God of the living and the dead. Whoa, what you say? And so here's Peter, James, and John witnessing Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus, verse 4. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And that's what you're going to say when you see heaven. Lord, it's good for us to be here. It ain't no clouds that we're going to be floating on, sipping on lemonade, looking at semi-transparent people, talking about, Charlie, Charlie, is that you? No, that's not heaven, that's Hollywood. We are going to experience the reality of heaven one day. I said, Pastor, what's heaven like? It's like earth. If earth has it, heaven has a better version. Well, tell me, I love roses. I just love roses. Is heaven going to have roses? Yes, yes, but no thorns. I love animals. I just love animals. I love lambs. I love lions. And they go, hey, yeah, but they won't, one won't eat the other. They'll lie down together. I love fishing. I love fish. I love fish. Whatever you have, and the lake is clear. You can see the fish. Come on, somebody. Mm -mm -mm. So they said, Lord, it's good for us to be here, but we need some tabernacles. Look at verse 4. Let us make here three tabernacles. What's a tabernacle? It's used to house the glory. To cover the glory. They recognize these are all glorified form. We need some tabernacles. He said, you need one, Jesus. Moses is going to need one. Elijah is going to need one. This loose glory running loose. This needs to be in a house. This needs to be tabernacled. That's a deep study, but it, it's real. They, 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 the tabernacle is what house the glory. And while he yet spake, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud. Now God going to talk. And what's he going to say? He's telling Moses, his lawgiver. He's telling Elijah, his representative of all prophecy. He's telling Peter, James, and John, and every believer in the New Testament, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. He's just given Jesus preeminence and complete jurisdiction and authority. He's higher than the law. He's higher than all prophecy because he's the fulfillment of law and he's the fulfillment of prophecy. And Moses is told, hear him and Elijah is told hear him glory to God he becomes the preeminent figure in this glorious mountain and the disciples fell on their face they didn't know what to think and Jesus had arise and be not afraid and when they opened their eyes they only saw Jesus I know I might be talking to somebody right now and you think it's a fairy tale. It's no fairy tale. It's the word of the living God. Eternal life is real. Eternal life is real. And you're going to experience it by death or you're going to experience it by the return of Jesus. So ask yourself this question. If you died today, would you step into eternity? If you died today, would heaven be your home? As soon, as sure as we have borne an earthly suit, we're going to bear a heavenly suit. And as sure as there is an end to a week, there's going to be an end to this time God has given this earth. And we are already past our sixth day. Think about this in Joshua. I'm almost done. This is stuff we read, you know, we were in Sunday school and children's ministry all our life. 
They marched around the walls of Jericho six, times, six days. It wasn't until the seventh day they entered in. There's stuff that man has been working around and walking around for 6,000 years, but we are nearing that threshold where we're going to enter in and those walls are going to come down and we're going to see days and walk in days that we only dreamed and heard about. God told his children in the book of Exodus, I want you to labor six days, but on that seventh, it's mine. Don't do any work. Take that day to be refreshed. Take that day to bring me glory. And that's what that 7,000th year is going to look like. But I want to give you, excuse me, some good news about that sixth day. The Bible says in the book of Exodus that on that sixth day, the children of Israel were told they could go out and gather twice as much bread as any other day of the week. That's in Exodus chapter 16, verse 22 which meant on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they could only gather so much bread. If they gathered too much, it would spoil the next morning. But on Friday, the, the, the sixth day, they could gather twice as much bread because it was going to be what they would carry over into that glorious day. Church, we are in the sixth day. We ought to see twice the number of souls, twice the number of, of, of favor, twice the blessing. We ought to see a double for our trouble because we are nearing that final grand closure. We're right there. Blessed to be here in this moment, in this time. I want to pray with you. And I want to pray for you and then I want to pray with you. Church is all wrapping up. And I ask you to bow your heads in prayer for a moment. And I ask you to process a few questions. Number one, if you died today, would heaven be your home? That's the most important one. If Jesus came tonight, would you go? 1 John 3, 2 says, when we see him, we shall be like him. God made man in his image. And there's coming a day where like Moses and Elijah look like Jesus. Because they saw him. The Bible says, as sure as we have borne the image of the earthly, we will bear the image of the heavenly. That's 1 Corinthians 15. If you're like me, you're looking at what's going on in this earth and you're so tired of the darkness and deception and corruption and violence and senseless killing and hate. We're looking for hope. We're looking for leaders. We're looking for something to change. There'll never be peace on this earth until Jesus reigns. It doesn't mean we give up, cave in, and quit. But he is our ultimate hope. And church, all the signs are there. He doesn't need anything else to happen to come back. Everything he said has happened. Stage is set. Things you might have looked at in God's word and said, oh, that could never happen. Now our reality. I think COVID opened up a lot of things for me. I was like, man, man can have this kind of power. And I already read that in Revelation. Church, open your eyes. It's real. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for any person right now that has not given their life to you, that this would be the day of their salvation. 
I pray for those that are saved, Father, that if we have fallen, that we would get up. If we are asleep, that we would wake up. If we are seated, that we would rise up. You said darkness will cover this earth, but for us to arise and shine, that your light would be seen on us. So help us to be that light in a world that needs the knowledge of who you are. Forgive us for trying to get more and just chasing stuff. All while selling you short and neglecting our own soul. For when we die, we carry nothing with us. I invite you to pray this prayer with me. If you want to believe on Jesus, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's not my words, it's his word. Not my words that saves, it's your faith. I'm just giving you this prayer as an avenue for you to turn your faith to Jesus. So I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, I've read in your word of an end. a day of judgment, the reality of eternal life. We don't live forever. Death is a reality and your return is a promise. I believe you are long suffering. You could have already judged this earth, my life included, but you are long-suffering. So I ask forgiveness of my sins and that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness, that you would use my life to bring you glory, to fulfill my purpose and to advance your kingdom. Use me as a light in the midst of darkness and that others see you in me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Can we stand together, give the Lord a hand clap offering for his word this morning, glory to God. Listen, we've got men and women of faith lined up here this morning. They're here to pray with you. So if you need prayer for any reason, family member, whatever it might be, come forward. Let one of these men and women of faith pray with you, okay? Otherwise, you are dismissed. Hope to see you here Wednesday night, 6.30 p.m. Have a blessed week. Listen, turn to somebody and say this. See you here. See you there. Are in the air. I love you guys. Be blessed.